you have your Bibles and would like to open to 1 Kings chapter 2, we'll sort of, I guess, continue our thoughts from this morning. I don't typically like to do part one, part two type stuff. It just, I know sometimes for me, I, I like to keep everything together, keep the information there together, but uh, sometimes when you're covering large books of history like 1 Kings that covers 300 and 70 or so years of history, it's hard to get all of that into uh, to one lesson. And so we have some time tonight, and I thought it might be appropriate for us to consider maybe the second part of uh, where we were headed this morning. If you'll remember that the question that really dominated our discussion this morning it was, who is the king? And we noticed how in 1 Kings chapter 1 that there were at least three different kings that were mentioned in the chapter. We're open with David and that David's health is declining, that physically and mentally David isn't able to lead the nation of Israel like he was before. And so there's this moment in time in which a king is about to take the throne and obviously the information on who was going to be the guy wasn't revealed to David's son Adonijah. And so he just decides, hey, I'm the guy. I'll take it upon myself to become the king. And we noticed how some of those tendencies that Adonijah had, those tendencies to exalt himself and to chase after his own pleasure and to oppose God's plans, those are tendencies that sometimes creep into our lives. And then we concluded our thoughts this morning by focusing in a small way on Solomon, that those three kings made an appearance in the book of First Kings and specifically in chapter 1. And that's not the extent of all of the kings that are mentioned in this particular book. A dominating theme in the whole book is kingship. That's the name First Kings, right? But we focused on this question, who is the king? Because that was really the dilemma for the nation of Israel. That they were wondering, what are we going to do? They had always had a king, right? They had Saul, that's 1 Samuel. Then they had David, that's 2 Samuel. And now you get to 1 Kings and David is dying. And naturally the people are like, well, what are we going to do now? Who's going to be the king? Is it going to be Absalom? Is it going to be Adonijah? Is it going to be Solomon? Who, who's it going to be? And so that's sort of the direction we went this morning, calling into question our own lives. Who is our king, right? But the second part of the, the, the sermon, I guess, that I had to move until today, I want to focus it around a question. Uh, naturally, what follows is, now that we've identified Jesus as our king, that's what I hope we've done. Remember that Solomon, in, in all of his glory, he, he still pointed to one greater than Solomon, New Testament writers would say, Jesus. And hopefully you and I tonight have identified Jesus as our king. But what now? I mean, that was true for the children of Israel. Solomon was appointed as heir to the throne of David, but what now? What was, what was Israel expected to do now that Solomon was going to take the throne? What was Solomon expected to do? What advice did David give to Solomon, his son, when it comes to leading God's people in the direction of God's will? What advice did David give him? That's what Eli read for us just a second ago. 1 Kings 2, verses 1 through 3. And really, verse 4 too, but I just tried to keep the reading a little short. But you think about those four verses, those first four verses in chapter 2, and we're going to let that serve as advice tonight for us. Now that we've identified Jesus as our king, that was question number one. Now we're going to answer the question, what do we do? What do we do? Now that we've identified our king, we, we want a king. We need a king. That's true of all of us. We need someone to rule our lives. And just like Adonijah proves in chapter 1, we are not good rulers of our own lives. So we identify Jesus as our king. What might we learn from David's advice to Solomon that will help you and I in our faith as we move forward toward heaven? Four things for us to consider tonight right here from these verses very quickly. Number one, I want you to notice that David tells Solomon, be strong in your faith. You and I tonight, we've identified Jesus as our king. I hope so. And maybe if you haven't, you'll choose to do so very soon. But when you do, what you're going to have to learn is how to be strong in your faith. Notice what David says in verse number two. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm nearing the end of my life. I'm dying. The natural progression of life is that you live in your vitality and in your youth, and then you make your way into adulthood and even into you know old age and your body. It just wears. That's just the natural progression of life. And I'm going that way. But look what he says. Be strong and show yourself a man. Be strong and show yourself a man. Now, you stop and to consider 
that phrase, I guess, and it's a compound phrase. There's really two thoughts, and they seem related, and I guess they are, but there's really two biblical concepts that are expounded on in more places than just 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 2. This is a biblical phrase and concept through and through, and here's how I know that it means something more than just manning up, right? Because sometimes that's what we tell folks. You just need to man up, right? You just need to get a little tougher. And maybe that is true of Solomon. Maybe he did need to man up because you think about the turmoil and the chaos and even some of the physical difficulties that Israel was facing. Solomon was going to have to man up, but there's a spiritual side of this. David was telling Solomon to be strong in his faith. Now, here's how I know that. Consider a couple of examples. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 through 8, you remember Moses when he was sort of preparing Joshua to take over leadership of the children of Israel? Do you remember what Moses said to Joshua? He said what? Be strong and courageous. Maybe you've read in Joshua several times where Joshua was ushering the children of Israel toward the promised land, to where he's leading them into battle after battle, after he's poising them at the the Jordan River to to move over on into the promised land. All of these things, right, that Joshua was doing to prepare the children of Israel. How many times are we reminded in the Scripture, especially in the book of Joshua, to be strong and courageous. He's not saying be physically strong. Don't go lift weights before you go over there to the Jordan River and take them across, right, Brandon? No CrossFit, Joshua. Just be strong. Be, be a person that is committed to growing in your emotional, mental, spiritual stature. This isn't a physical thing. This is a decision to be firm in my faith. What about these other uh, other places in the scripture like Paul in Ephesians 6 and verse 10? You remember when he talks about that armor of God? And this is really the start of the section, verses 10 through 18. But he starts his discussion of the armor of God by saying this. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. What's your advice, Paul, when you're preparing to fight against the wiles of the devil? That's what he says in Ephesians 6. Is grow in your faith. Know what you believe. Be firm in that. Don't waver. Don't go back and forth. Be on the fence, in and out, hot or cold. Know what you believe and be strong in that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, Beware, be watchful, be strong, act like men. Paul echoes what was said in 1 Kings chapter 2 from David to Solomon. But emphasis on this phrase, be strong. David, what are you telling Solomon to do right here? Not go lift weights. Not go work out, not work on your physical stature, none of that stuff. He's telling Solomon, you're going to have to decide what you believe. You're going to have to know what you're going to have to believe. You're you're going to have to know who you are and what you are, and you're going to have to stand firm in that. But then add this element. He says, show yourself to be a man or act like a man. Nowhere in the scriptures, and this is a phrase that happens more than once. Actually, I already mentioned to you 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 13. But there are a lot of times in which this phrase makes an appearance. And what we're not doing is comparing a man versus a woman. When he says act like a man, he's not saying act like a man as opposed to how a woman acts. But essentially what you see, the parallel in the scripture is act like a man instead of acting like a child. Let me give you two examples of this in the New Testament. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, first of all. Ephesians chapter 4, and let's read together in verse number... Uh, Verse number 11, Ephesians 4 and verse number 11. The Bible says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Verse 13, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now listen to this. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, we have one part. You said, Ty, it's not that he's comparing how a man acts to how a woman acts, but a man to a child. Look at verse 14. So that we may no longer be what? Children. Paul, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying that I gave you all of these spiritual avenues for you to grow. I gave you prophets and teachers and evangelists and all of these things to equip you spiritually so that you'll know what you believe and you'll be firm in what you believe so that you'll act like a man as opposed to acting like a child. Paul, what do you mean? That children, they're easily tossed to and fro. Throw a little incentive in there and you can make a child do just about anything. I don't want you to be like that. I want you to be firm in your convictions. Be strong. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 
1 Corinthians chapter 16. I referenced it a moment ago. Look at verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 13. Be watchful, Paul says. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Now, earlier in 1 Corinthians 14, it's interesting that Paul would repeat it, but in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20, listen to this. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but listen to this, but in your thinking be mature. Twice in the book of 1 Corinthians does Paul encourage them to be mature or to act like men as opposed to being child, childish in their faith. He even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you remember, he says, if I, I put away childish things, I, I've accomplished this maturity, verse number 11, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 11. It's a common theme in the New Testament for Paul to encourage Christians to be strong in their faith, to develop this resolve to be faithful to what they know is true and to not be thrown or tossed or motivated by incentives, but they're firm and strong in what they believe. Who's my king? Jesus. What do I do now? Now that I've made Jesus my king, I'm strong in my faith. Number two, what do I learn from 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, David's advice to Solomon as a new king. Number two, you got to obey God. That's what he says in verse number three. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. That's what Solomon told David, or David told Solomon. This isn't going to work. Solomon's reign isn't going to work over Israel if he doesn't acknowledge God. How do I know? Read 1 Samuel. Read 2 Samuel. Read all of those times, even in the judges, when you have the nation of Israel in a desperate situation to the point that they cry out in their desperation to God to fix the mess that the ruler that was leading them in led them in the wrong way. He didn't honor God's word, and he would raise up these judges to bring them back to God's word so that they could see and enjoy peace. But the second that God's word was despised and not obeyed, God's people ended up in a mess every time. That's the story of the Israelites, that every time God's word was forsaken, they ended up in a mess. We said this morning that was one thing that Adonijah didn't do. Remember that he invited these people to his becoming a king party? It says that he invited these certain group of people, but he didn't invite Nathan the prophet. Why? Why did he not invite the prophet? Because the prophet's job was to tell him God's word. And he knew he was wrong. And he knew he couldn't invite the prophet because if he heard God's word, he knew he had to be wrong. He knew that he couldn't do what he was trying to do. There's a huge emphasis in these first two chapters, yeah, even in the book of 1 Kings, on a respect for God's word and the necessity of obeying it. David said to Solomon, my son, you're taking over this throne. What I'm asking you to do is develop this resolve to stand firm on what you believe. Don't be a child that might be tossed to and fro by the opinions of whoever comes in your room here and tells you what they think you ought to do. Be firm in what you believe. But do it based on God's word. Keep the charge of God. And then, then he expounds on what that actually looks like, verse 3. By walking in his ways, by keeping his statutes, by his commandments, his rules, his testimonies, as it's written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. David, what's the key to being successful in life? And I think you look at a man here who has lived his life both on the good side of life and on the bad side of life, to experience the bliss of being in the presence of God, to where there were several occasions in the Psalms where he would write, I literally want nothing more than to dwell in the presence of my God. He even says, I, if I only had one day, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than I would to experience blessings anywhere else. That's David, this guy who knew what it was like to be in the bliss of God's presence. But he was also the same guy in Psalm 51 that said, Please, God, don't cast me out of your presence. I know I've done wrong. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse me. He knew what it was like to experience bliss and experience misery in, in God's eyes. And so here you have a guy who's lived it, who's lived goodness, and he's lived sin. And he's telling his son, If I could give you any advice in living out the will of God, I would tell you to obey it. I would tell you to obey it. And that's strong words coming from David because he knew what it was like to not obey him. 
And he knew the misery that came along with it when he had to deal with the consequences of his sin. When he had to look in the face of the people that he had betrayed. He had to deal with his son who had gone off the rails, Absalom, when he was living in sin and rebellion. I mean, all of these things and ways that David's life was wrecked by sin and how easily it would callous him against God and say, you know what, he didn't help me in those times. But David just couldn't do that because God did help him. He said, Solomon, if I've got any advice for you, obey God. Be strong in your faith. Obey God. Number three tonight, now that you've named Jesus your king, what do I do? What can I do with that information? What does Solomon tell David? Rather, David tells Solomon. I'm going to get that right. I've said it 15 times. David told Solomon, number three, keep your reward in mind. Remember why you're doing what you do. We talk about this often. I try to tie this in. This helps me in my faith to keep my reward in mind. Look what he says in verse number four. Continuing this thought from verse three that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way, and they walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel, David says. In other words, he reminds them of the promises that God had made, not just to David, but to their forefathers, that so long as they stayed faithful to the word of God, what law they had written and they had before them, that Solomon had access to, of course, and the fact that Solomon had Nathan the prophet to tell him anything he wanted from God. He had a direct line of communication to God. David says, so long as you heed to the words of God, you'll be blessed. That you'll never have to wonder if God's plan is going to continue or not. You stay faithful and I promise it will continue. I promise that all of the promises that God made, they'll come to fruition. And that same advice is good for you and I today. In the midst of all kinds of chaos and turmoil and the times where we're living for God really good and the times where we slip up and the times we fail, this one promise remains true. From the beginning of Genesis chapter 1 to the end of Revelation 22, you stay the course and God will make good on his promises. That that reward that God promised for you, it will come true if you're strong in your faith and you obey God. Keep your reward in mind. We talked about those children sometimes and you tell them, hey, if you do this, I'll get you this. You know, I'll get you this if you just behave right here, right? Mom always used to, I told you a couple weeks ago I had to get a shot for that sinus infection and I went and got myself a milkshake after. I knew I could get through the doctor because mom says, hey, if you get through this, we'll get you a milkshake. That reward is an incentive for us to keep going, even sometimes to endure painful stuff. Even if we know it's going to be painful, why do we keep going? Because we know what we're going to get on the other side is worth every second of that pain. I don't know about shots, but everything else in the world, it might be worth every second of that pain. So it is with your spiritual lives. Heaven is surely worth it, right? Then this, number four, what does David tell Solomon that might help him? And now that there's a new king in Israel, Solomon is the king, but I think there are parallels for you and I today. What might we remember now that we've named Jesus our king? And this is a big one. This is a big one. You've got to decide to root out evil in your life. You've got to decide to root out evil in your life. These first three things, they don't matter if you don't take away the things that are hurting you in the first place. If you don't decisively root out those things that are bad for you in in your life, to identify the things that are causing problems in the first place, to identify that sin, to identify that struggle, and actually decide to be intentional about doing something about it. Now look what happens in verse number 5. David's talking to Solomon, but he says this, Moreover, you also know what Joab did to me. And you know how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner and Amasa, whom he killed, avenging in the time of peace for blood that had been shed in war and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. David reminds him what Joab did, the two trusted soldiers. Look at verse 6. Act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. And so what David says to Solomon is, you remember what's evil in your life, what caused problems in the nation of Israel altogether, and you deal accordingly with it, Solomon. Use your wisdom, use your kingship to do what you know is right and to root out those problems for you. Then he says this in verse 7, But deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai and let them be among your table, for with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom. And so David conversely says, Deal with evil properly, but don't forget the good things. 
Don't forget the people who were good to you. That's a good lesson for us. I didn't have number five, but we could make that number five. Don't forget the people who are good to you. But I really want to focus on what happens for the rest of chapter two. And I'm not going to read all of it. There's 46 verses of it. But you start right there in verse number five, and you read through the rest of the chapter with the exception of about three verses, verses 10 through 12, where David dies. And you're going to see how Solomon uses this first, I guess, little time of his reign as king to root out the things that are problems, to root out the people that are problems, to get rid of the things that are causing problems for the people of Israel. He knew that if he didn't deal with them immediately, they would be a problem forever. What is it for you tonight? What's the sin that, that causes you problems? What's the problematic thing in your life that keeps you from being strong in your faith? What's the problematic thing that makes it hard for you to obey God? What's the problematic thing that keeps you from thinking about the reward that sometimes maybe even makes you forsake that reward for a time to do whatever it is that makes you happy? Moses would say something like that, and even New Testament writers would echo it, that you would chase the pleasures of sin for a season, that it's only a season, it's just temporary, and you would be willing to trade an eternal reward for something that only satisfies momentarily. What's the problematic thing in your life that's keeping you from living a God-honoring life? Decide tonight to fix it. Decide right now to get rid of it. Whatever it is, decide to be intentional about rooting out evil. And that's what David's advice was to Solomon. Be strong in your faith. Obey the Lord. Remember your reward. Get rid of evil. I think that's solid advice for us tonight who are trying to live God-honoring lives. People that want to do our best to please the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, the one who gives us so much Hope that's your goal tonight, to live a God-honoring life. Maybe you're not a Christian. You never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity tonight to do that, to obey God, to live a life that's free from sin, a life that, like David, has known what it's like to live in the depths of sin, but to be placed back up on those high places, to have a new position and new footing and a new chance. You, you can experience that tonight, too, by being lowered into the watery grave of baptism and raised again, Paul says, a new life, Romans 6, 3 and following. Or maybe you are a Christian and maybe somewhere along the lines the obedience thing, it's struggled or the maybe you've lost sight of your reward. I'm not, I'm not sure. It probably differs for all of us. Decide tonight to fix the problem as we stand and as we sing.